welcome to the stage Michael Enright and Paul Hoffert. Uh, we'll see what happens when legendary journalist encounters legendary musician. Polly, your microphone is in your seat. Michael, you'll find yours there too. Thank you both. Thank you. Good morning, sir. How you doing, Michael? I just thought listening there that uh, as I work for the CBC, I think we're the largest manufacturer in Canada of wicked problems. Uh, and solutions are hard to come by. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you here and because I feel like I've known you and known your music. Um, I was talking to people here this morning and <laughs> said that Lighthouse changed the way we thought about music, rock and roll, back in the day, and I thank you for that. Well, thank you. Um, if you look at my sort of career and the various things that I've done, you might have um, two conclusions. First is uh, I have sort of attention deficit disorder because I keep doing a bunch of different things. Um, and for me, the, the one thread that has gone through the things that I'm interested in, uh, whether they're technology innovation or uh, musical creativity, is the fact that, um, and I want to harken back to um, Bill Buxton's uh, comments yesterday, that risk and innovation are very exciting for me. And there's nothing I like better than like um, walking down a, a, a metaphorical hallway, seeing a bunch of doors, opening a door, um, and seeing something that looks like an interesting landscape on the other side and sort of uh, quickly jumping in without regard for whether it's, there's a cliff at the other end or whatever. And Lighthouse was that, because Lighthouse was a, was a, a, a lofty attempt by Skip right. Prokop and myself to somehow, in the late 60s, of course, the environment was good, um, you know, uh, uh, peace, love, groovy, let's unite those people who like classical music, the jazz fans, the generations that go along with those things, with the, the young uh, asset heads who are doing rock and roll, so. Yeah, it's interesting reading your CV and uh, all the things you've done. One could come away with the feeling that you, you can't hold a job. You just, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I want to talk about the bagel effect, your book. Um, first of all, Montreal bagels or Toronto bagels? Do you have a view on Toronto which Toronto bagels. The best? Yeah, I know people will be mad. I know. The, the Toronto right. bagels, not sweet, not chewy, just like sort of crunchy. <laughs> Grife's bagels. The, the idea <laughs> of the book was that controlled things, methodologies have moved from the center to the edge. Just expand on that. What, what does it mean? What's the impact of that? Well, the, the quick sort of sound bite of a sort of complex uh, 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 theory is that when you had a whole bunch of very powerful trends at the end of the 20th century, uh, the two largest of which were the collapse of the Soviet sort of system of government, which is all based on centralized control, centralized power, uh, you know, projecting into the future, communism, all of that kind of stuff. 1989, yeah. 1989. So that, that fell, and around the same time, within a few years, you had uh, the internet, which had been around for a couple of decades, probably just among universities, but it exploded through this new layer of the internet called the, the World Wide Web in 1993, which was at its heart, through the technology of the way it was designed, uh, which was to be able to withstand a nuclear attack on the United States yeah. and not to have any center that could be destroyed and having all of the power distributed along uh, the edges. To you disperse had, it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you had this, uh, these two incredibly strong forces for hollowing out the middle, for basically uh, disintermediating um, everything in the world. Then the specifics were that um, around that time there was, uh, there was some uh, uh, recessionary forces and people were trying to save money. So as they downsized their businesses and used the new technology, they got rid of middle management. And then companies started realizing that you had to go big or stay a boutique business. And uh, the, the implications of the so-called, oh, I called it a bagel because if you look at an organizational diagram, usually is a circle. 
and you take the center out, it looks like a torus. I could have called it the torus effect, but I thought it would be a little more popular to call it the bagel effect. So, uh, so that in a nutshell was that. And the implications of that have been, uh, I guess like Marshall McLuhan, I used abduction, which was you just basically guess and then hope it works out. You know, and, and so, uh, but it's turned out that uh, uh, now there's all kinds of, you know, not so good, you know, the, the, the middle class is being hollowed out, you know, more people, more mm -hmm. rich people, and that this intermediation, I think when historians look back at the turn of the 21st century, will be the single most uh, uh, important issue that's driving uh, certainly the Western world. But what do you replace those elements that have, who, uh, whose control has been decentralized? What do you replace it with? Um, well, maybe nothing. So that's what we're here, right? That's what we're talking about. The question yeah. is, do you replace, do you replace things? Do you try to have an evolutionary uh, reaction to change? Or do you have a revolutionary reaction to change? And um, as you can see by the fact that we can't always agree here, and we're a pretty homogeneous group of music industry players. Right. When you start getting the consumers into the mix, uh, and the freedom of speech uh, advocates and, and everything like that, it becomes, it becomes pretty complicated. But I'd like to observe, I was glad that the, uh, that the Value Web put the uh, welcome back, let's focus on ecosystems and sustainability. If I might just uh, have a word on that, so you'll have you know, my, well, I got the stage for now, right? So uh, the, the current systems, and it goes to your question of how do you replace it. Uh, the, the current uh, business models that we are looking at as the possible future salvation of our industry are absolutely not sustainable and do not... As they're configured now. As they're configured now. So the, right. the two examples are kind of the download model. Apple came up with it. It's a model that is uh, almost an exact replica of the 19th century music business as applied to online, uh, and it's not sustainable for a couple of reasons. It's not sustainable ultimately because as the only game in town that sort of works, it's very successful, and I applaud Apple for you know, getting us some stuff, but at a dollar a tune, the pricing is definitely not right because we used to pay a dollar a tune for a, a CD with the tunes and the plastic and the manufacturing costs and everything like that. So if you're an economist, you would say the efficiencies of moving to just selling the intellectual property over a distribution network that costs almost nothing should result in a much lower cost to the consumer. So the fact that consumers are grumbling and not too happy yeah. with this stuff is not a solution. But the biggest thing is, if all of those who favor government intervention in a strong way in terms of uh, changing the legal regime and uh, PIPA and SOCA and and uh, you know, uh, piracy laws and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and we look at the Apple model. My nice watch over here, which is actually an iPod, you know, holds 15,000 songs. And the statistics of the people who have iPods and iPads and all kinds of MP3 devices is that the percentage of music on their devices that they've uh, bought from iTunes or legally from other services is about two to three percent. So of the 15,000 songs on my, uh, on my watch, I couldn't pay for them. I mean, I would never pay $15,000. If we say, is this a sustainable model? Like, we'll fix everything in the industry, we'll get everybody to pay, and yeah, and now that we'll be able to replace all the income because I'm gonna buy a $100 device and pay $15,000 for the license to the music on it. It's not, not, a, not gonna work. So no matter how you look at it, it's one of these transitionary, uh, you know, it's what we got yeah. is what it is. And Apple did a great job of that. Then you look at the other side, which is, okay, there's a download. And then the other people say, oh, you'll never download anything. You don't need it. Just mm -hmm. stream it, P2P, whatever you want. And the <coughs> leading proponent we all know is uh, Spotify, which has, um, you know, not only the support of the majors, but they own it, you know, along with Zuckerberg, you know, from Facebook. From Facebook. Yeah. So you've got the, the industry heavyweights, $800 million 
behind this company, hasn't had an IPO yet. And, uh, and that's like the savior. I looked around for figures of 2011, the most recent figures, on uh, to reverse engineer the payout model for creators, for artists and, and, and songwriters on, uh, on Spotify. And I'm not dissing the, the service, nor am I dissing the Apple service, but if you're looking for a sustainable model, in order to earn $10,000 in royalties from Spotify last year, an artist had to have 48 million plays, right? To make $10,000. To make $10,000. So we look at this and we say, well, you know, will that really get better with scale? Like how much, you know, is that really the sustainable model uh, that we want? So anyway, I, I, you know, I, I, I just, from my perspective, we, when I look at sustainability, I'm really disappointed, I'm appalled, and I'm extremely surprised as a guy who for a while was a futurist and I wrote a bunch of books and sort of predicted the future. And what I really got wrong was that 15, 20 years later, we'd still be sitting in a room and it doesn't seem to be any, any solution that's sustainable for the old one. So my short answer to you is, you know, I don't know how we're going to replace anything or, or if it, we're going to have to start from scratch. I don't know. Okay, now this would be the point where I would say, well, give me three ways out or three solutions, but I don't think there are any. But give me, give me three obstacles. Okay, I'll give uh, the, you one the major ones that okay. have to be overcome. I'll give you one obstacle okay. and one solution that I think are the best. And I haven't changed my mind about this for a long time. However, very few people have agreed with me on it. <laughs> but here you have, again, I have the stage. So the one biggest problem is uh, what we're going to be talking about uh, uh, tomorrow, metadata. Uh, and, uh, and what Jim Griffin is working on is a registry for works. Without a doubt, one of the two huge gorillas that was in the room when uh, Sean Fanning uh, purportedly offered the record labels a deal with a lot of money on the table, and maybe, you know, in a parallel universe, everything got solved. So the <laughs> biggest problem was that the record companies, and it's no different from, uh, from the other rights holders, I'm just using them as the example in this case, and not as, not as, as bad guys, the way they ran and run their business today is that when they sign contracts um, with their artists and their production companies and their labels, the contracts are all negotiated one off, one by one, and the rights that get transferred are, have never been captured in a database internally, even at the record company. So Bruce Springsteen gets a record deal, for example, his manager says, okay, you can have these rights, these rights, these territories, this amount of time, but we want approval um, on all digital deals yeah. or else you can't have the digital rights. So that's okay, that, that goes in. So that contract then goes into a box. It's like a paper contract, there's a, there's a file, but the contract goes into a box somewhere and the record company memorializes the general payment terms for Bruce Springsteen in a database so that their accounting department can pay or not pay Bruce Springsteen, no matter how you look at it. But I mean, there's yeah. something that says the royalty rate is so much in this territory for so many years and everything like that. And all these other terms uh, don't get done. A year to 18 months later, because the, the, the policy of managers is that you have all this paper around and it's dangerous and everything, they take all the contracts, they put them in boxes and they send them to a warehouse. So what happens is Sean Fanning says, okay, give me the rights and we'll make to, a deal. Yeah. And, and so one of the things is, you know, the record companies say, holy cow, like we don't know what rights we have. And generally the way that record companies and others in our industry do business is it's easier to say I'm sorry than to ask permission. So basically they go around and saying, we have the rights, here's our roster. And they do deals and they get advances and they do stuff. And then when they find out that individual uh, artists that they represent, that they don't have the rights, they, they make a deal with them. They, they settle it out or they get sued and it, something happens. Yeah. But it's easier for them to do it. The lack of a global database 
of who owns what in a changing environment where every year or two rights revert and people mm -hmm. do different deals and different territories is, um, is a rat's nest. I see that as a major impediment and I think all the players have been working hard for the to last 15 to years Sorry. to get that. We're still not there, but I can see an end in sight. After um, the bagel effect, you wrote a book called All Together Now. Yes. And that was about, that, the emphasis was on community, I take it. Yeah. Was that a response to the diffusion that you talked about in the first book? And how, how were you defining community? How were you marshalling that idea of, of community? Because you're dealing with, with a rational order of machinery, of devices. Right. With human beings, with all of the flaws and craziness. How, how do you conform the one to right. the other? OK, so I like to use a lot of induction, which is go from the specific to the general. Um, I ran a research center for 10 years at York University. Um, and in that age of uh, uh, when Al Gore introduced the term the information superhighway, uh, because his, uh, his father had introduced the uh, physical superhighway system in the United States, uh, then everything exploded after 1993. And um, companies and governments uh, and consumer groups and everybody and media companies were incredibly interested to know what were the opportunities with the, with the web and with this new uh, network of sure. distribution. So in the United States, there was a big trial that Warner Brothers and a couple of partners were doing in Florida to test movies on demand, which they thought was the killer app. At York University, my colleagues and I uh, uh, felt that movies on demand uh, uh, would not likely be the killer app, and that like the telephone, the new networks, the new communication systems, might have a whole bunch of different pieces that might make it valuable as opposed to one particular killer app. So we decided we would do a trial. Uh, and in Canada, we were able to uh, uh, raise 100 million bucks, most of it in kind, from uh, you know, the, the logical sources, IBM and Apple and, uh, and uh, Cisco and the technology companies and the media companies and everybody got together and we went to a real estate developer and built a neighborhood um, as an exurb of Toronto. Uh, and half the homes had uh, 15 megabits in and out and video telephones and everything, and half didn't. So the reason I wrote that book is I wanted to be able to take the results that we found. And you know, being a university kind of thing, we were looking at changes in socialization and a whole bunch of not, not just the people who order pizzas online. And in doing that, I didn't want to just report on our Finding So I looked around the world at what was happening yeah. as you moved from the creation of places where we live based on their proximity to uh, water routes, automobile routes, and air routes to the new paradigm of being close to an information route and what impact that might have on the future of how, how we live. And the emphasis, though, is on social connections, right? That, that's the whole idea of it. it yeah, and that was certainly, uh, I mean, I would say when we went in, we didn't really know. It was kind of a yeah, shotgun yeah. approach. But what came out of it that was surprising and, and was valuable in the, um, in the uh, scientific literature is that instead of what people uh, expected, which would be at that time that uh, if you give everybody uh, uh, computers and video telephones and everything, they'll cocoon in their homes and they'll have mediated communication with others, good or bad, but uh, that their face-to-face -face time would decline. And we found that the opposite was true, that the people in the neighborhood got to know their neighbors uh, by just pressing you know, some of the buttons on the video phones, and they, but, uh, they met them more frequently face-to-face -face and were friendlier and stuff like but that. But the problem I have with that, though, is if, if the emphasis is on community and sharing, and I think it's called frictionless sharing of books and music and all that kind of stuff, doesn't that presume that individual experience is somehow inferior to community experience? Zuckerberg says, who would you rather go to a movie with, your friends or yourself? And he answers, you'd rather go with your friends. Well, no. <laughs> you know, exactly. sometimes, sometimes I want to go alone, right? Can you have too much community? 
well, it's an interesting comment. I think this is a matter of, of culture and in different human societies at different times, uh, we've had the balance one way and the other. Uh, Chinese culture, for example, is, uh, is incredibly uh, steeped in Confucianism and the idea that the community is more important than Communal, the self. Yeah. And then that became a fertile ground for communism, which in that one way, uh, you know, was mm. a similar thing. Uh, now you go to China and they're kind of, they all want to be Americans. And, uh, and it's kind of the other way around. So um, I think that's a fair observation, but I don't think it's necessarily human nature to be one extreme or the other. We make societies from time to time that favor one or the other. Tell me about your involvement with McLuhan, because you were, you, you, he had an impact on you, the way he looked at things and his so-called probes. What, what did you take from him? Uh, I'll tell you a little story uh, that's, uh, that's uh, emblematic of um, what I thought of Marshall McLuhan. And I'll say that just the short answer is, I really knew from almost the moment I met Marshall McLuhan that he was a genius or a lunatic. I, and I thought he was probably a genius because I had no idea what he was talking about. And that meant that I was either an idiot or not smart enough to do it, which was the case. Um, but it was hard to tell. And at the time, there were people on, on one side or the other. So uh, I had written um, a violin concerto that got a bunch of airplay and uh, was recorded as a, as a disc. And we needed uh, somebody to write the liner notes. So the graphic artist, uh, Robert Burns, who had done the cover, said, I know this guy, Marshall McLuhan. He's a famous guy. He said, oh, Marshall McLuhan, Andy Hall, a film star. So he said, why don't you meet him? Maybe he'll write the liner notes. Uh, he's a famous guy. So I said, OK. So Robert introduced me to Marshall McLuhan. And we immediately uh, had um, a very close uh, association, in part because Marshall McLuhan uh, saw the world and looked at the world and made all of his observations in the same way that artists do. He was a closet artist, or he considered himself an artist. Yeah. You know, I spoke about induction and deduction being sort of the two academically acceptable ways of thinking, but McLuhan used abduction. Abduction is what artists use. Is he basically say, uh, the ball goes in the hole, I see a pool table, so, you know, probably somebody had a pool cue and hit a ball into it. And like string theory in science, uh, it's not a, it's, it, you know, the, uh, the academic community doesn't really like that because you could have an infinite number of other theories that would give you the same result. result yeah. And unless you can prove one or the other, you, and, yeah. and, but McLuhan just thought, and it was great because, you know, we sit and you free associate with him and he had this like stream of consciousness stuff that he, a lot of his books had. So we got along well, and then finally it came time, I said, you know, we have to get these liner notes in, will you write the liner notes for my uh, record? And he said, yeah, and he said, tell me about it. And it was, um, the recording was one of the first tapeless recordings in those days. It was a transition to digital, something called direct to disc. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it does, I, won't, I won't belabor it, but, uh, we were in a recording studio, and he was intrigued by the fact that the sound, instead of being recorded and then transferred to a disc, the sound was used to directly cut a master with the guy running the lathe and opening and closing the grooves and stuff. So he wrote the stuff. So he said, uh, I don't want to, it's a lot of trouble for me to write stuff down. He said, why don't you come over to my house again tomorrow night? And we'll have a little discussion. So I went over his house, and um, <coughs> Uh, he said, there's a piece of paper and a pen. He said, I'm just going to like talk about stuff. You write it down, and you'll come back tomorrow, and I'll proof it, and that'll be the liner notes. <laughs> so I said, OK. So I'm, I'm sitting, you're Marshall McLuhan. I'm sitting here. And he starts talking. And I'm going like this. And I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> I have like, there's like, I'm even looking for like some, some kind of a hook that I can grab onto, <laughs> that I can, I, I can organize it. So I just start like writing feverishly, and um, I came home that night and I said to my wife Brenda, you know, it's happened. You know, I've been unmasked. You know, he's going to know that I'm a really an idiot. I have no idea what he's talking about, and we've been, you know, going through this uh, this little dance and everything like that. So anyway, I went. And it was it was before I even had a word processor. It was like 1978. So I had to type this thing out, 
I get to Marshall McLuhan's home the next evening, and uh, we sit down, and he, and he uh, foregoes the usual chit-chat, and he says, let me see what you have. So I said, uh, here, and I give him the thing, and Marshall McLuhan goes, perfect. <laughs> 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 Which he follows up with, you know, Paul, most people have no idea what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> and uh, you're one of the first people that really gets it. Yeah. And so for, and that, that, that was our bond. And that's why the man me, was a giant. That's, that's smart, why the man was a giant. Yeah. So anyway, that's my little Marshall McLuhan story. And it took me decades to actually understand. I do think I understand what he was getting at now. But it wasn't, it wasn't all clear to me at the time. How do you, how does your personal life intersect with your professional life? How do you, with the web and, and the, the things that you do, because you see, you bring your own experience to what you do professionally, right? The Globe and Mail, I think, at one point said that you've lived most of your life engaging in serious play, which I is kind that. of nice. I should use that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's you did. That's pretty good. Yeah, I kind of do things that, uh, that engage me. Um, you know, I used to trivial, trivialize it and said, I, just, I, I go through life and I try to have fun. And that's kind of true, but um, I like the word play because not everything is fun. But uh, pretty well all the stuff that I've done is stuff that interests me. And uh, for me, that's, that's all that counts. So it's all in the journey. And uh, I never planned for the future. I have, you know, I would have never believed if when I was 20 years old or 30 years old, that somebody would uh, tell me that I would be an academic. Uh, you know, I, I, didn't, I came to academia quite late in life. I never thought I would write a book. I had no writing skills. I studied mathematics, physics, and chemistry in university. Never had to write an essay. And, uh, and it only came about because I started talking about some of my ideas at, um, at uh, you know, conferences and stuff. And uh, Brenda introduced me to a guy who was a speaking agent. And so he started getting me uh, yeah. work and getting paid for it, which was really nice. And then he said, I can't get you any more money until you write a book. Yeah. And I said, why would I write a book? I go around talking but, about the fact that books aren't going to be around. But you but were a member of the musicians union before you were old enough to drive. Yeah, I was, so I think, the youngest were, member of the Toronto Musician, so 14 years old. The idea, I take it, was you were going to be a musician. Oh, for sure. Period. Yeah, that worked out. <laughs> Did it ever? Yeah. yeah, I know. I never had any doubt. I mean, music is uh, is my passion. All the ecstatic. I love the examples of music, you know, producing ecstatic experiences. And in, in my life, I've always I've searched for higher powers through organized religions and uh, spirituality and everything like that. Uh, and for me, what gets me those ecstatic moments is music. So. Do you listen to music every day? Um. No, I try not to listen to too much music. I don't like background music very much. Right. So um, uh, Brenda and others in my family work with music all the time, and there's always music around. But uh, I, I like my music dedicated to, um, to my focus. How do you use the net in a daily, in a daily way? Oh, I use the net a lot. I can't imagine existing now. It's so hard to remember what it was like before even before there was wiki, before there was cell phones. I mean, it's hard enough to, like, to, 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 to organize myself with all of these incredible assistants. Uh, and I guess it was even more difficult before. And I, I, um, I am more frequently showing up nowadays the right days for meetings and uh, occasionally on the right time and stuff than ever before. So, I mean, it's really helped me. But uh, not to be flip about it, um, it's like if you grow up with um, an alphabet. I'll go back to McLuhan. McLuhan got started. He was an English professor right. uh, and, a, and a poetry uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah. uh, major. And he started looking at the impact of um, human uh, history, human prehistory, when we moved from uh, what he and other media theorists called the oral age or orality, yeah. where we're speaking and, and we communicate without any medium. In other words, the brain actually gets the messages from the ear uh, and, and doesn't have to decode them. It's like, it's, it's in our DNA. 
And then when we created alphabets, we went from like oral beings to visual beings, and reading and writing have to go through our eyes, so the brain has, it's, it's the medium. And that's where we got the idea the medium yeah, is the message, yeah. that the whole thing came from that. So, uh, where was I going with People that? misunderstand that phrase too, by the way. Of course it's, they understand uh, it. And McLuhan, in his, in his, in his quirky sort of uh, uh, comedic way, um, uh, also had, there's another story that I never knew about until a year ago. And I, I spent some time because it was a big anniversary of McLuhan's 100th birthday. And Eric McLuhan, his son, who I know, told me that when the, the galleys for his book, which was called The Message is the Medium, and that's what everybody knows, when they were delivered to their home, Eric went to the front door, uh, you know, got the envelope out, took out the galleys, and said, oh my god, I can't show this to dad, because they had misspelled uh, the message, and it said, the massage oh, is the medium. <laughs> and so Eric, you know, again, tiptoed up to his dad, who was, you know, sitting reading or something, and he said, uh, uh, he said, uh, you know, you're really going to have to call those people. The galleys are all wrong. They, like, they misspelled the, the title. Mm -hmm. And so McLuhan, Eric tells me, looked at the thing and said, the massage is the medium. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and so the book came out. And for years, yeah. I, I saw the book. And I said, the <laughs> massage is the medium. Is that the real book? And yeah, he, the, the book came out. Yeah. And it, it never actually says the message is the medium. It says the massage is the medium. That's the title. And what he meant about that was really closer. It didn't, it didn't scan as well as the message is the medium. But what he meant about that was that the medium massages the message, not that the medium That's is true. the entire uh, message. And boy, today, when we're with iPods and iPads and all of that kind of stuff, uh, we can use that wisdom and apply it so directly at the time we didn't have the gadgets, but uh, now you can really see it. It's great talking to you. Thank you. Paul Hoffert, thank you. Thank you, Michael.